In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, this is a pretty meaty section, so I hope you're hungry. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's important. Uh, morality, it's we're going back to human nature, we're going back to the passions, we're going to virtue, we're going to the cardinal virtues, we're going to the theological virtues. We got a lot of stuff to do. Okay, we left off last time talking about the integral good, namely that in order for an action to be good, uh, the object had to be good, so what you're doing, why you're doing it, the intention, and the circumstances. Uh, all those things have to be good. If there's a defect in any one of those, then it's the whole thing's defective. Just like, you know, there's probably, what, 20,000 signatures that have to happen for every space shuttle launch. It's like, if you have one defect in a, in a launch, you know, that could, that could turn out uh, horribly, all right? So, um, all of it's gotta be good. Now we're gonna talk about uh, the passions, because as we said before, uh, what we are, is a rational animal, and we're gonna we're gonna break this out a little bit more. Uh, last time we were just talking about intellect and will, so now my artistic skills on full display. Uh, so intellect, will, these are the two faculties of our soul, of a rational soul. No, I'm not decapitating my little friend here. But uh, this is part of the, um, the rational soul is intellect and will, our ability to reason to choose freely. But we are also animals. <laughs> and so, you know, obviously our brains can be like animal brains too, I get it. But just for the purposes of, of making some distinctions here, uh, we are very much like the beasts, Okay. And so, um, if you have your book, uh, roughly page uh, 110, if you're following electronically, number 370. And so, part of our physical body, uh, we have what are called passions, okay? Those aren't like you love interests, okay? These are something else. The passions are the feelings, the emotions, or the movements of the sensible appetite. So the movements of our, of our physical body. We are moved by things. Uh, natural components of human psychology, which incline a person to act or not to act in view of what is perceived as good or evil. The principal passions are love and hatred, desire and fear, joy, sadness, anger. The chief passion is love, which is drawn by the attraction of the good uh, one can only love what is good, whether it's real or apparent. So, um, we are a lot like our pets physically. Um, in fact, genetically, we're very, you know, pretty close to, to monkeys and chimpanzees or whatever. But like, we have hearts, we have lungs, we have livers. That's what I mean by being uh, close. And uh, we also, like the beasts, have passions. Now, passions, that sounds a lot like the passion, as in the passion of our Lord. Uh, and this is coming from uh, the idea to, uh, to suffer or permit to happen to you. That's, or the passive voice, if you're a grammarian, okay? An act, the active voice in grammar is, uh, I, I hit the board, okay? The passive voice is, I'm hit by the pen, okay? So something's being done to you. You're being passive. Um, the Lord entered into his passion, meaning, you know, he was, uh, he was ridiculed, uh, he was beaten, uh, he was slapped, spit upon, he doesn't open his mouth. He's very, very passive during his work of redemption, okay? Now, our emotions, they work on us, don't they? In fact, they have a mind of their own a lot of times, and we kind of get hit one way or the other by our different emotions, so that's what we mean by passions. So, I mean, 
just looking at the root of that word, I've never looked at it before, but moved from. That's what the etymology appears to be. Moved, a, from. We're moved by our passions towards anger or towards sadness or whatever. All right, so intellect, will, that's part of our rational soul. Within our body, there are two main groupings of passions or emotions. Uh, one is called the irascible appetite. Uh, ira means wrath or anger. Irras, irasib, no, B. <laughs> Able to uh, be angry. So if you're irascible, you're, you tend to anger. And anger is response to something that's uh, an injustice or something that's difficult. So in other words, your irascible emotions or appetites, they correspond with what's perceived as a difficult, oops, good or evil. In other words, uh, an athlete before a game uh, is probably listening to rap music. Why? Because rap music pertains to the irascible appetite. Get you pumped up, ready to go. Because what you're about to do is very, very difficult. It's a difficult good to win a game. And so you are working yourself up emotionally in order to be able to attack uh, something difficult. Or uh, it's fight or flight, uh, uh, fight or flight uh, instincts here. You hear somebody breaking into your house in the middle of the night, you better believe this thing's going to get flared up real quick, okay? Um, because this may turn in, you know, this may be very difficult. Um, so that's pertaining to something that's perceived as a difficult good. But you also have other emotions that aren't about things being difficult, but rather you have other things that are simply good, or goods. And th these are what are called the concupiscible appetites. Concupiscible appetites. Um, just desire, these are fancy words, just ignore them if you want. Um, it just, it's so when you're hungry and food is put before you, your concupiscible appetite's gonna be inflamed. If you're thirsty and a glass of water is placed in front of you, your concupiscible appetite will be inflamed. Just like what? Your dogs and your cats, right? You know, no different. Uh, and also in regards to our reproductive uh, faculties, okay? When you're presented with a good, in that sense, uh, you have a desire to pursue that good, okay? So, in other words, we have... One, two, three, four main groupings in our human nature, okay? Now, these four main areas are going to correspond with the four cardinal virtues, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. I just want to kind of give a, give a sense of who our stick man is and how he is uh, constituted, good or bad. Um, yeah, so we need, so the principle, now we're talking about love. Um, when we're talking about our emotions, maybe a good way to make a distinction is like with our will, our rational will, maybe that corresponds with like capital L love, okay? As opposed to distinguish it from on a mere natural level, not natural, on a mere um, uh, passionate level, your emotional level, there is like lowercase love. Just being attracted to the good. Okay, um, being attracted to food when you're hungry, to drink, etc. So that that's a principal emotion, and it is opposed by hate. So an aversion. So I don't know. Uh, maybe it's spoiled food. Well, get that away from me. Um, or just something else that is distasteful. Okay. Um, so you're either going to be drawn to something or you're going to have an aversion uh, to it. Now, there's also things like uh, desire versus fear. This is in regards to a future, future good or evil. So if you're anticipating something awesome is going to happen this afternoon, 
you're full of desire and hope. You're looking forward to it. But if something really dreaded is coming, like that dentist appointment uh, this afternoon, all right, you're not in the dentist chair right now. You don't hear that high-pitched demonic sound of a drill right now, but you are anticipating it. And so we can perceive these things. The same as uh, animals can perceive a scent, maybe, or a sound, or um, they don't have too much of a concept of, of the future, but I guess enough to to have both desire and fear, okay? Um, as well as, there's another one, joy, and that's opposed by sadness. Sadness. And that's a present, good, or evil. So when you're at the victorious game and, every, and your, your side's winning or whatever, you're very joyful, or when... You can only announce vows because they're drilling in your mouth. One is very sad, okay? You are there, okay? So um, we also have uh, anger, but interesting is that anger doesn't have an opposite. Uh, uh, anger sort of sits on its own. It's neither good nor bad. Even the Lord got angry. But uh, usually we, we run into trouble because we lack control over our anger. That's usually where we get into trouble. Uh, anger is a response to a perceived um, uh, justice or, or a difficult thing. You know, if, uh, if you know, uh, Mama Bear is trying to protect her cubs and she perceives, you know, a threat, she's going to get angry. Okay? Our, our pets get angry. Um, uh, so, that's, so that's that. And did I miss anything in that paragraph? Okay, so... Mercies. No. Um, and so... One thing that... Alright, let's go ahead into the next one. We'll tie it together. Uh, 371. Our, our passions... Are these things good or bad or what? The passions are just movements of the sense of appetite. They are neither good nor bad in and of themselves. Why? Because where does morality reside? In what part of the human person does morality, the moral act, reside? The will. What you choose to do. If you are just having a weird emotion, um, it, it doesn't mean anything. So as we're going through the moral section of the catechism, I'm hoping that we'll also be able to improve upon our, uh, our confessions. To be more precise in our confessions. And so to make this point... Because morality resides in the will and not in any of these emotions, um, there's no need ever to say in confession, Father, well, I felt sad. I felt fear. Something like that. Just, in, just on the mere level of emotion. Because you're, you're, the, moral, the morality of your actions are, are not rooted there. But, there's a big but, is that these sometimes can impact what? Our choices. Like if you wake up on the wrong side of a bed, on the bed, and somebody you normally wouldn't be upset over comes and starts a conversation with you, and you are short and curt with them, actually kind of rude to them, okay, was an emotion, you know, at play here? Was there something physiologically at play here? Were you just in an irascible mood? Uh, maybe, and maybe normally you wouldn't have been rude to that person, but your emotions disposed you such that you were in fact rude and you are still culpable. Um, but, uh, emotions, uh, passions, they can either assist us in doing what's right for instance, if you do hear a burglar breaking into the house and your um, fear and anger get worked up such that you have the ability to, uh, to, to protect your family, which may mean you know, mortal combat with some burglar, your emotions in that case are helping you to do the proper act, you know, to protect your family. But... As we all know, a lot of times our emotions persuade us to maybe not do something that's right. Okay. So uh, they impact our thought process and how we 
in what we choose, but we can't, but we still have to take responsibility. Okay. We're a complex uh, being. Angels don't have to worry about this, by the way. <laughs> they don't. They just kind of float around, a little head with the intellect and will, and um, they don't have to worry about it. Nor do, nor do animals. They just, they just do what they do, and based on their emotion. But we straddle this sort of metaphysical divide between the spirit world and the, the mere physical world. And so we're kind of complex creatures in that sense. Okay. Uh, what else? All right, the moral conscience. What is the moral conscience? The moral conscience present in the heart of the person is a judgment of reason which at the appropriate moment enjoins him to do good and to avoid evil. Thanks to moral conscience, the human person perceives the moral quality of the act, whether it's to be done or which has already been done, permitting him to assume responsibility for the act. When attentive to moral conscience, the prudent person can hear the voice of God who speaks to him or her. All right. So even that word, conscience, uh, the root of it is scientia or knowledge. That almost sounds like a faculty of the intellect. So it's in your soul. It's in, it's, in, uh, it's in your rational soul, this idea of conscience. And it helps you, as it said, to evaluate, to be able to see and to evaluate a particular action. Was, is this good? Or was it good if it was in the past or not? Uh, such that we are to, to follow it. Um, and it, it does sort of approximate the voice of God uh, in, in us. It's that important and inviolable. And we'll kind of flesh this out in the next couple questions. But does it have to be taught? Yeah, we're getting there. Okay. What does the dignity of the human person imply for the moral conscience? Uh, essentially, um, because of this personal dignity, no one may be forced to act contrary to his conscience, okay? Um, nor within the limits of the common good to prevent from acting according to it, even especially in religious matters. So again, we're going back to the idea of human dignity and what we are. Uh, we are human persons that have the faculty uh, to know and to choose, and we have the faculty to evaluate the moral quality of an action, and we have responsibility to follow our conscience, to follow what we perceive to be good, and we cannot be coerced otherwise. Okay? We cannot be coerced otherwise. So when you hear about all these mandates out there, you have to factor in this. People cannot be coerced. Um, now, how is a moral conscience formed uh, to be upright and truthful? Because it cannot sometimes, uh, and we'll get to that. An upright or true moral conscience is formed by education and by assimilating the word of God and the teaching of the church. You hear that? So it can't be in contrast to the word of God or to the teachings of the church. The moral conscience is not doing whatever I want. It's got to be properly formed. And that formation comes by the hand of the word of God and the teaching of the church. And I would argue reason. It is supported by the gift of the Holy Spirit and helped by the advice of wise people. Prayer and, exam and an examination of conscience can always greatly assist one's moral formation. So let's just kind of go through these next uh, two as well and kind of wrap it all up, tie it all together. What norms must conscience always follow? The general principle, one may never do evil so that good may result from it. Okay? We are so tempted to do that. Oh, well, my heart's in the right direction or it's for a good cause. You can never do good in order that, uh, you can never do evil in order that good may come from it. It is contrary to our nature, for our will is attracted to the good. And so to do that action, 
would be uh, to 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 do purposely an evil act, something that we know is contrary to the good, in order that some other good may come of it, it is contrary to our who we are as human persons. And back to the other principle that action follows being, or I have it backwards there. Uh, being out of being flows your action. What you should be doing, you know. Uh, should be coming uh, from who you are. We are rational creatures, so we must not only act rationally in all of our doings, but also, according to our nature, our will is designed to be attracted to the good, not to something that's evil. And so if you're going to do something evil, you are violating uh, your dignity as a human person. Oh, just because some, some good may come of it. No. We have to honor our dignity as human persons, and recognize um, our human nature as such, and follow these uh, these principles. All right, that's number one: uh, never to do evil that good may result. Number two: the golden rule: whatever you wish men would do to you, do so to them. Lastly, charity always proceeds by way of respect for one's neighbor and his conscience, even though this does not mean accepting as good something that is objectively evil. All right, but let's keep going. Can a moral conscience make erroneous judgments? A person must always obey a certain judgment of his own conscience, but he could make erroneous judgments for reasons that may not always exempt him from personal guilt. However, an evil act committed through involuntary ignorance is not imputable to the person, even though the act remains objectively evil. One must therefore work to correct the errors of moral conscience. All right, so we've got a couple things there. The second one I think is kind of easier to deal with. There are some things that people simply don't know is right or wrong. Like, and honestly, I think there's, there's a difference from generation, one generation to the next. I mean, my generation doesn't know anything, essentially, <laughs> especially when it comes to morality um, and duties towards holy religion. Um, and so even the concept of the precepts of the church, having to go to confession once a year, um, you know, a lot in my generation probably don't know that. But if you grew up with your Baltimore Catechism, you probably do. But with that said, you've had so much chaos in the life of the church the last 50 years, maybe you walked away thinking, well, maybe this stuff isn't required anymore. There's been a lot of chaos and a lot of people are confused. All right, so some of that could mitigate your culpability, but haha, sorry, I ruined your day. No, it still applies. The precepts of the church, including confession once a year. So if you're purposely not going to confession once a year, that is grave matter, and thus, not only potentially, but likely mortal sin. Because the church has that, um, that power, that, that authority from Christ our Lord. But not everybody knows it, so I get to be somebody who ruins other people's day sometimes and lets them know, well... This is actually the case, or not the case. So that can be, that can mitigate one's guilt, personal guilt. Of course, one is responsible to form their conscience, to be pursuing God, to be trying to understand your faith better, uh, to understand, all right, what are the rules here of being Catholic? Like, people, they have that responsibility to seek that stuff out, okay? Anyway, so that's the one side, but... Um, there are, other, there are other things that happen that mess up our moral conscience and we're still responsible for. St. Paul says that sin darkens the intellect. And perhaps maybe you recall back in your teenage years, maybe you had a friend who lived a morally upright life, but then was introduced to a sin, one, one sin or another, whatever it is, and maybe at first kind of felt bad about it, but then they became habituated to it. Are you talking about me? <laughs> it's probably all of us to a certain extent. Um, and before long, they're making excuses for their actions and getting indignant and even probably yelling at you. Why are you judging me? Well, because you're acting like an idiot, okay? And I'm trying to help you. Um, but uh, that type of darkening of our intellect because we're embracing the darkness of sin that has an effect, all right? So it also, you know, we, we've got to be patient with folks too, 
and realize that maybe they just don't see it. I mean, maybe we you know we ought to be encouraging them to see it, but at any rate, so sin can darken the intellect. Um, but just never even trying to form your conscience, never even uh, striving to see what does Christ teach, what does the Bible teach, what does the church teach, things of that nature. Like, you know, at some point, you got to start taking responsibility, in other words, okay? Now, where that is, this is where the Lord, we cannot jump into the judgment seat of our Lord, okay, with individual cases. We simply can't. But what we can do is uh, uh, draw some parameters. And um, anyway. So that's that. Can you share information with people when you know they're not doing things right? That's an issue of prudence, which we'll get into. Yes. Um, yes. But, yeah. All right. Uh, anything on uh, the conscience or passions? Any questions before we jump into the virtues, which is an important section? And only on those two topics. Not like aliens or something. We can do that at the end. All right. All right. So now we're going to jump into virtues. Um, okay. Virtue. The root of that word is vir, which means? True. No, you're thinking of veritas. Uh, man, as opposed to femina, which means woman. So uh, virtue, it's, a, well, it's, it's a power. Virtue is a power. But this idea of sort of, uh, you know, man or power, the ability to, to do something or whatever. So, but uh, virtue is a power or ability uh, to do something, okay? And it's contrasted by vice. We'll get to vice eventually. All right, but a fuller definition of virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do the good. So habitual and firm disposition to do the good. Now habitual. We are habitual creatures. I don't think I need to explain that to you. Other than it can be towards good habits or bad habits. But because of our human nature, because we have bodies, because we have things like muscle memory and endorphins and all these things, uh, we are habitual creatures. And we'll probably talk more about that later. So a habitual and firm, meaning uh, it's pretty reliable, disposition to do, to do the good. So in this case, so power or disposition um, to do the good. So for instance, Probably the first virtuous act of the day is that we, what, don't hit the snooze button. You get up when you, in a quarter three, unless you're sick, that's another. But, uh, all right, according to reason, you're like, all right, I need to get up at this time for X, Y, and Z reasons. Um, but you, hit, you hear the alarm, you feel tired, and it's like um, you either have a good habit of just getting up even if you feel a little tired, uh, or... You're in the habit of hitting the snooze button, okay? But um, a habitual and firm disposition. So if you have the virtue or the habit, good habit of, of waking up uh, in the morning, then you do that most all mornings, okay? Maybe with some few exceptions, okay? To do a good, a good that's perceived by our intellect. Okay, so it's a power. Now, there are seven ultimate virtues that we talk about. First four correspond with our human nature. These are the human or cardinal virtues. Okay, cardinal not because they like birds or something, but cardo, cardinus in Latin means hinge, and we'll see why they use that. The human virtues are habitual and stable perfections of the intellect and will that govern our actions, order our passions, and guide our conduct according to uh, faith and uh, to reason and faith. They are acquired and strengthened by the repetition of morally good acts, and they are purified and elevated by grace. All right. Uh, the next, next one has the word hinges. 379, what are the principal human virtues? The principal human virtues are called the cardinal virtues, 
uh, under which all the other virtues are grouped and which are the hinges of a virtuous life, okay? So that's where you get cardinal. It means hinge, okay? Sort of like the cardinals of the church, um, the close proximity to the office of the papacy. Um, there's, well, I'd have to do some more research as to why this idea of hinge with that particular office, but at any rate, that's what we're talking about. Um, so the four human virtues, and then the three theological virtues, which we'll talk about. Uh, faith, hope, and charity, which we all know. Okay. Um, so these four human or cardinal virtues correspond with our four main faculties. Okay? So what corresponds to... Our intellect um, is prudence. All right, so if somebody is prudent, they're able to see a situation very well, to read a situation, be circumspect, to have a sense of the consequences. So, but it, it, it pertains to our intellect. Now, the other three virtues, uh, they are going to be connected with the will. And one, uh, which is, uh, corresponds directly with the will, with no, with no dealings with the passions, is justice. You know what, let's just bring it down here. So intellect is prudence. The will is justice. All right, uh, which is, well, let me just enumerate them, then we'll quickly uh, define them. The... The will, as it pertains to our irascible appetites, that's what's called fortitude. To do the difficult, uh, to pursue what is difficult, in other words. The will, as it uh, relates to or is impacted by our concupiscible appetites, is temperance. Okay. So, um... Let's take a quick look at all these. Uh, so prudence disposes reason to discern in every circumstance our true good and to choose the right means of achieving it. Prudence guides the other. All right. So our lives are pretty complicated. Um, and to know what is the right thing to do in any and all circumstances, you need a virtue to, to help you, namely that of prudence. Maybe you know some impru imprudent people in your life. I can think of some in my own life and just how routinely they make the imprudent decision, like what they post on social media or say publicly or whatever, okay? Um, so uh, we actually have, we won't go into it today, but the gift of the Holy Spirit of counsel, so all these things can be elevated in the supernatural life, and so the gift of counsel, and I talk about that a lot, um, uh, to be able to, by the help of the Holy Spirit, in those very delicate situations, and usually dealing like with family or whatever, all right, how do I navigate this? A lot of times I can't tell you the answer, but the Holy Spirit can, but it's on how you're able to see a situation. Uh, and so prudence guides the other virtues by pointing out their rule and measure. So traditionally, prudence was called the charioteer of the virtues, okay? He's the one sort of guiding all of them. So uh, prudence is the one helping you to evaluate what's just in a particular situation, a transaction or whatever, help you to understand um, what is the right amount of fortitude in a given situation. Actually, we'll kind of circle back to this as well, so I can kind of give you a sense of directing these other virtues. So let's jump to uh, justice. Justice, <laughs> two little lines. You have no idea how much we had to learn about justice in seminary. <laughs> the justice confirms in, uh, justice consists in the firm and constant will to give to others their due. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So it's, in a way, it's very simple. Uh, give to others their due. Okay, what is due to them? Just um, and so, 
this I, the, justice is by far the most voluminous uh, in, when theologians uh, consider uh, you know the various virtues and morality. Um, there's a lot. Let me start to pull up on, in, in St. Thomas's Summa just to give you a sense of just what all things are covered in it. But think about it. How do you interact with your neighbor? Um, what, do you, what do you owe them? You owe them, for instance, not to let your dog use their front yard as a, as a uh, bathroom, for instance. Um, what do you owe the government? Now, of course, we can all uh, debate. Uh, you, know, d you know, government doesn't, certainly doesn't have the right to tax us 99%. But what is that correct number? That's up for debate. But we owe the government something because we got roads out there. We have a legal system and the rest of it. So we owe, um, we owe something. All right. Uh, and then we owe God something. God created us. He suffered and died for us. He offers... Uh, he offers salvation to us, life with him. Um, I say we owe him something. And so everything, when it comes to religion, and we're looking at the full spectrum of, of the human experience, uh, holy religion is not, oh, I feel like doing that on Sunday morning. It makes me feel good. No. No. Holy religion is, resides in the will and it's guided by the virtue of justice. So everything, um, it's what we owe God, okay? So I pulled this up. So I'm just gonna start listing a bunch of different, uh, both virtues and vices that uh, are, are dealt with under the issue of, of justice and giving others their due. All right, so um, the justice we had towards government, the justice government has towards us, like not to violate our rights. Um, restitution, respect for persons, murder, bodily injury, theft, robbery, uh, uh, accusing, judging, uh, well, also in trials, defendants, witnesses, defending attorney, reviling, backbiting, tail uh, bearing, derision, making fun of people, like in an uncharitable way, cursing, uh, cheating, usury, um, what else? Religion and it's, all right, so this deals with religion. Devotion, prayer, what do we owe God in prayer? A bodily reverence. Now, some people are in a wheelchair and they can't genuflect. Okay, remember, it's all guided by reason. But if you are an able-bodied person, to just walk past the Blessed Sacrament, knowing what the Blessed Sacrament is, and not even making any, any sign of reverence. Now, maybe some people don't even realize that they see a relative, they get excited, they just walk kind of right past and uh, 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 uh. But this is why we genuflect. This is why we bow. Because we're body and soul, because God has redeemed not only our souls, but also our body. Guess what? Bodily reverence is due to him. Now, how that is spelled out can differ from tradition to tradition. Like an Eastern Catholic doesn't genuflect nearly as much as a Western Catholic. But Eastern Catholics do a whole lot more deep bowing and crossing themselves, which we don't. Okay? I mean, they'll do that like 200 times at Mass. All right. So, um, bodily reverence, uh, offering things to God, sacrifices, oblations, first fruits, tithing. Vows. Vows are under the uh, virtue of justice. Adjuration, that is, you know, so and so, I command you in God's name to tell me, or for instance, when the Lord was under trial, we command you in the name of the Most High, tell us, are you the Christ? That's when the Lord opens his mouth, when he's adjured. He's commanded by invoking God's name to say something. Prayer, praise, uh, superstition. Idolatry, divination, going to palm readers, for instance. Observances, undue worship of the true God. Um, participating in pagan rituals. Introducing pagan rituals into Catholic worship. I won't go into that. Uh, tempting God, perjury, sacrilege, 
It's like taking a consecrated chalice and using it at lunch and pouring a Coke in it. And, uh, simony, uh, selling uh, religious services or, or um, things of that nature. Uh, uh, dulia, which is worship, uh, adoration, obedience, disobedience, gratitude, ingratitude, vengeance, truth, lying, dissimulation and hypocrisy, boasting, irony, friendliness or affability, as opposed to flattery, uh, quarreling, liberality, which is, you know, you're generous to help people, covet versus covetousness, okay? So there's a lot there. In each one of those, it's like, pfft, there's a ton of considerations, and there are explanations as to why, okay? But obviously, we don't have enough time to do all that. All right, um, fortitude. Fortitude assures firmness in difficulties and constancy in pursuit of the good. It reaches even to the ability of possibly sacrificing one's own life for a just cause. All right, so I mentioned the first act of virtue of the day. Well, really, it could be an act of fortitude to, uh, if you're really tired, but you know you got to be somewhere or help somebody or whatever the case may be, you get up. So it can be as small as getting up on time, you know, when it's difficult. Um, but it can also, you know, uh, reach a crescendo. Like, if you don't forge these numbers, we're going to fire you. Or just know that you're not going to get the, uh, the promotion you want unless you, you know, lie about something or, um, again, fudge your numbers or, or do something else that's, you know, unethical. Uh, so, so doing that. Um, when you're a cleric and you're being interviewed in a, in a national thing and uh, a non-Christian uh, asks uh, whether or not they're in a bad position for not accepting Christ, what are you going to say at that moment? Um, yes, I'm thinking of a specific example in that one. Uh, or, but the, uh, the, the highest uh, act of fortitude um, is uh, what you see in martyrs. You know, to offer your life um, for somebody else, but ultimately uh, for God. But... Um, Look, fortitude is very important because we got, you know, consistency is the name of the game in pursuing the moral life and, and, and developing virtue, etc. And so um, doing what uh, we don't always feel like doing, sticking to a schedule. We don't even think about these things, but by sticking to a schedule, not that uh, we, we should have flexibility, don't get me wrong, but even those little acts of dying to self, you know, put away the, uh, the, the social media because I've got my next appointment for instance. Um, that's a little act of, of self-denial. And sometimes when we're so glued to the news or social media or whatever, and we're not even sticking to a basic thing like a schedule, that's respecting other people's time, by the way. Um, you see how sort of important that is in, in everyday Christian life. All right, uh, temperance. And so, of course, this is connected with the irascible appetite um, fortitude. So therefore, good. Now, the last section, the last main faculty of us, we did our regular emotions, the concupiscible appetites that are just attracted to regular goods, food, uh, drink, um, reproduction, okay? These are guided by temperance. Temperance moderates the attraction of pleasures, assures the mastery of the will over instincts, and provides balance in the use of created goods. That's the distinction between an animal and a human. Well, animals, they just, they just do. Well, oh, I know. Yeah. They basically, they, don't have, they have instincts. Mm -hmm. That's it. They react yeah. to the instincts. and they react to their instincts. Um, whereas we, we are going to be influenced by our, by our instincts, by our emotions. We're going to be tempted to overeat, to overdrink, to engage our reproductive faculties outside of the proper context. But as I said, Catholic moral theology is all about the application of reason to every human activity. So when it comes to how much food do we eat, there's going to be a difference between an NFL player and a 90-pound ba ballerina. So we're not going to be talking about how many slices of pizza because everybody's stomach is slightly different. 
but there is that virtuous limit. You know when you're full and when you don't need to eat anymore. Uh, but uh, because of our fallen human nature, uh, this just gets inflamed, our concupiscible appetite that is, and it influences uh, how we see the situation. And then our will convince our intellect, ah, oh, go ahead, have that 18th slice of pizza. <laughs> and then we do it, but it's stupid because you don't need 18 slices. You need two or three or four or whatever. Um, so it's the application thereof. And let's be honest, we're not going to go into all the, the sin that comes to the sixth and ninth commandment, but our concupiscible appetites in regards to reproduction, uh, they, can, they can blind us to, you know, doing the right thing and trick us into doing the wrong thing. You know, cheating on your spouse or whatever the case may be. Um, and so, uh, but at the end of the day, um, it's irrational because there's a certain context for reproductive organ use. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the commandments. But I think everybody can agree there are at least some parameters. For instance, rape, all right, is out of bounds. Um, you know, and other horrible, disgusting things, okay? Those are out of bounds, okay? All right, um, so those are the cardinal virtues. Um, let's talk about the theological virtues. Uh, these theological virtues, God has given, the theological virtues have God himself as their origin, motive, and direct object. All right, so one thing that separates the human virtues from the theological virtues is that these have God as their object, their goal, okay? Um, infused with sanctifying grace, they bestow on one the capacity to live in a relationship with the Trinity. They are the foundation and the energizing force of the Christian's moral activity, and they give life to the human virtues. They are the pledge of the presence and action of the Holy Spirit and the faculties of the human being. All right. Now, we know what they are, faith, hope, and charity, okay? Now, given that we've break, broken down uh, human nature, where do you think faith resides? One, two, three, or four? Intellect. Intellect, yeah. all right? Faith is what is, it's a, it's a faculty, it's a power of the intellect. It's not. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe God and all that he has revealed to us and that the church proposes for our belief because God is truth itself. By faith, the human person freely commits himself to God. Therefore, the believer seeks to know and do the will of God because faith works through charity. All right, there's a lot there. So um, there are a few things, and we talked about this very early last year, about um, faith and reason. Our fallen human intellect itself can know a couple of things. Number one, that God exists. You don't need faith to know that God exists because there are different arguments such as causality. Why is there something as opposed to nothing, for instance, and what caused it? At some point, you're going to come to a definition of God, the unmoved first mover, for instance. Um, and um, uh, so that's the main one, that God exists. We can absolutely know, okay? You don't need any church for that. But um, we need a certain faculty in order to know other things. For instance, the incarnation. Your Christ walking the earth, uh, it wasn't immediately clear that he's God in the flesh, for he looked like any other man. Now, he performed miracles that helped really get our attention, but faith is something even deeper than that, being wowed by a miracle. Faith is a capacity to know, um, to know who God is and what he has revealed. So see it as, and I mentioned this with faith and reason, like binoculars or something like that, or a telescope. So... A telescope helps us to see something very, very far away, which by our own human nature, we would never be able to see. 
or a microscope to see something very, very small. So you see that instrument provides us an ability that naturally we do not possess. So the virtue, the theological virtue of faith is an instrument. It's a power in order to see, and, and uh, to see what in this case? Whatever God has revealed. Okay? As a, so it's, it's a power. It's an objective power inside our intellect. As opposed to uh, Lutherans believe that it's entirely subjective. That it's not an external power given to our intellect. It's just our coming to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. And so it's much more subjective. Whereas our concept of, of faith is much more objective. A telescope, for instance. So that's just, you know, one of countless examples of how Protestants and Catholics are different. Even how they understand, and we understand, faith. Okay, so that is faith. Now, the other, all right, charity. Where do you think uh, charity resides? One, two, three, or four? In the will, number two. Okay, Deb, easy enough. It's what we, we choose to love. Okay, it's a faculty of our will. Now, hope is a little uh, trickier, okay? It's not immediately obvious, but hope also resides in the will, okay? So, so that's where these, um, they're, where these reside. Let's take a look to see. Um, all right, what is hope? Hope is a theological virtue by which we desire, you hear that? Desire, that's an act of the will, desire and await from God eternal life as our happiness. Placing our trust in Christ's promises and relying on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit to merit it and to persevere to the end of our earthly life. All right. So it's our choosing to trust that Christ can bring us to our supernatural end. Okay. Okay. Uh, one thing I neglected to cover was a very important concept. It's that virtue, where's my thing? All right, so virtue stands in the middle of two extremes. So extreme, virtue, extreme. Give you an example, the issue of fortitude. There are two extremes, but the, 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 the virtue of fortitude stands in between. So by means of an example, you have um, undue fear, overly fearful. All right, we'll just put fear, okay? But understand that it's like timidity type of fear. That's one extreme. The other extreme is what's called daring. So what? All right. So what's an example of these? Uh, undue fear. All right. Say your husband burglar breaks in. Um, yeah, uh, it's going to be a little bit frightful. But if you are so timid that you're not going to protect your family, and he's just going to come in and, and slaughter your family, all right. That, that's a defect there. That's an extreme. All right. You can't be that fearful. Or if. Uh, if, if you're a parent and your child is in uh, a, a, uh, a situation where they could die, you could perhaps uh, res uh, have bodily injury, but not being, being arrested in fear, in other words, okay? Now, there is another extreme, that of daring. That is being so, so bold, you're just being stupid, all right? So if you're in a battle and your side is completely overwhelmed, it's like a handful of soldiers, and the Soviets are coming with their tanks, okay? Um, for you to say, yeah, we're going to take this on, and you're going to go running into the battlefield, that is not bravery. That is stupidity. It's All right? And so that's an extreme, okay? So uh, fortitude stands in the middle. All right? So, yeah, there are bullets whizzing by you, but uh, look, you're in this battle, the... There's a reasonable chance for success. You go running into the next to foxhole or whatever. So that's an example. An example with hope. What are the two extremes of hope? 
One is despair, right? It's lacking hope or lacking sufficient hope. You know, my sin is too big. God will never forgive me. He will never bring me into eternal glory, okay? That is a defect, okay? But the other extreme is what we see way too common. That is presumption. Presumption. And you see a lot of that today. That's why I get very upset because um, I think that's leading souls astray. You can't do that. The virtue of hope stands in between despair and presumption. All right, one last one, charity. Charity is a theological virtue by which we love God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves for love of God. Jesus makes charity the new commandment, the fullness of the law. It is the bond of perfection and the foundation of all the other virtues to which it gives life, inspiration, and order. Without charity, I'm nothing and I gain nothing from St. Paul. All right, so it is choosing God in all things, including um, loving our neighbor out of love for God. Being so consumed by God and willing him, choosing him, uniting our wills with his in all things. Or as St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, in her little way, you do even the smallest things, like uh, uh, um, sweeping the kitchen. Uh, to, not to do that begrudgingly, but to do that with love. To be mindful of God and to be loving God in that action. Okay? That's St. Therese's little way. It's beautiful. Okay? Um, it's the great, uh, St. Paul says, you know, in the end there's faith, hope, and charity. But charity, no, in the end, charity is the greatest. Okay, I can have faith to move mountains, but if I have not charity, then I'm nothing. Okay, so I don't know how Martin Luther got away with, we can be saved by faith alone. Especially when the book of James says that we are not saved by faith alone. Um, but, see, Paul also saying that, you know, faith without love is nothing. Okay. All right, uh, good. I think we got through pretty much everything I wanted to. We'll be take, picking it up from there. Any last minute questions? Good. <laughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the The Lord be with you. Through the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. 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 Thanks, y'all. Get you another cookie.